Wentworth Woodhouse is undergoing a transformation to secure its future for generations to come. From the spring of 2019 until the summer of 2021, a vast programme of emergency repair work has been undertaken. Much of this was necessary to prevent rainwater getting inside the building and involved the repair and replacement of literally acres of roof coverings. But it also involved significant levels of repair and restoration to large areas of decorative stonework. Filmed in the late autumn of 2020, we take a detailed look at the work involved and the challenges faced by the craftspeople and the management team during the global pandemic. Hello, I'm Giles Proctor. I'm an architect at Historic England and today I'm joined by Sean Knight uh, of HMC Masonry. Sean. Yeah, hi, I'm Sean. I'm uh, the Managing Director of Heritage Masonry. I'm also the site foreman for the masonry works here at Wentworth Woodhouse. As you've seen from the um, um, drone footage at the beginning of this video, Wentworth Woodhouse is a really enormous house. It's essentially a very large house, which we're sitting in at the moment, uh, on one side, with an absolutely vast house attached to the other side of it, uh, and a sort of bit of a mess in the middle. Um, and it's a grade one listed building, and the thing about that is it's one of the most important buildings in the country, you know, along with St Paul's Cathedral or York Minster and buildings like that. And it's really sort of special to the history of the nation, but also particularly special to this area where it's for a long time, it was an absolute powerhouse, not only employing large numbers of people at the house, but also supporting huge numbers of people in the various enterprises which, which produced the money to keep this place running. And so what we've been trying to do is support the Preservation Trust in carrying this work forward by getting the building back into a good state of repair so that they can concentrate on building up uh, the building as a visitor attraction and generating income for its ongoing maintenance. The role of Historic England in a project like this is to, I mean, we spent quite a long time sort of chivying things along, trying to actually encourage works to be carried out to this building. But then we were in the fortunate position to be able to channel funding into the works and to support this, these essential first phases. And we're so that um, by the time we finished, we are going to have done most of the roofs to the east side of the house, which is the major portion of it, and also quite a lot of work to the stable block and the riding school, which is going to be developed into um, a major sort of visitor centre for events in order to um, raise funding for the maintenance of the house. Um, so, as part of that, Sean, um, you, you've been really sort of dealing with quite a lot of the stonework on the house, and um, there have been some sort of really interesting aspects to that. Um, I don't know whether you will want to uh, pick out particular things. I, I mean, actually, I'd quite like to ask you about the um, lady in the baby statue, which we saw this, uh, this morning. Yeah. Um... Certainly all elements of the work have been challenging in their, in their own sort of way um, and some of them very interesting in the way the building has been repaired in the past, um, which has sort of exacerbated some of the problems we've now found. Um, so the whole building in general has been very interesting, very intriguing um, and been a case of sort of evaluating why things were done in the past and, and moving forward. Um, the lady and baby was probably the most challenging aspect of the project itself. Um, we believe at a later date she was repaired with the waste taken off and a, a ferrous dowel or an iron dowel put into the waistband to sort of secure her. And then at a later date, when that didn't work, a copper band put across her back to sort of secure her to the building. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it became ferrous and expanded and the, the damage to the statue itself was quite severe. Um, it ended up the, the top section was in five parts. Um, and essentially was almost on the verge of sort of being beyond repair and, and becoming unstable. 
Um, so we managed to take her down and, and get her repaired with a variety of different repairs in liaison with yourself and, and the other contractors, um, the architect and the structural engineer. Um, and over months, we've managed to carefully restore her back. But yeah, it's been really challenging. Um, happy with the end product, um, safe in the knowledge that it's secure for, for future generations, but it's certainly very challenging. Yeah. And, and the urns were quite a tricky problem as well. I mean, I remember um, being sort of shocked by the um, uh, feeble supports which had been added to them in the uh, recent past. And uh, they're fairly hefty objects, aren't they? Yes. So essentially, we, we, we estimate them to be about 650 kgs. Um, and we believe that the, um, the sheer weight of them caused the stone to snap on the necks. Um, now they've lasted a very long time, but there were obviously issues for um, sort of the last hundred years because they have been repaired before. And the repairs you're talking about are the, the small copper bands. Yeah. Um, yes. Now the copper itself is flexible in your hand. So how that was ever gonna hold 650 kg of force on it, we just don't understand the methodology. Now it worked, it kept it clamped to the building but it doesn't make any sense to us now. So we've managed to remove them from the building and they were carefully craned down and gone into our um, urn yard to be carefully restored. Um, and it's probably something that we'd like to look at, you know, sort of on site. Um, but yeah, it's been very challenging in working out how we can get them fixed back onto the building secure without replacing essentially good units of stone that yeah. unfortunately have just broken under the weight of the, the, the urn itself. Yes. I mean, one of the things that you notice here is that although some of the stone has eroded, most of it is in fabulous condition. Yeah, very good condition. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and some of the mouldings themselves are, are perfect, you know, almost to the point where you can still see the original carving marks. Yeah. Um, sadly, in some areas there has been erosion um, and, and we are in the process of indenting and repairing them. Um, and they will look back to the way they were originally. Um, the challenge is in, in separating those units now to be able to identify and get into those um, sections of erosion to replace them. So some of it might be done very, very conservatively um, and other areas we've had to replace full sections of stone. Yeah. And the, um, the other challenging aspect was the work to the cornice. You worked on the cornice on the south side of the building. That's correct, yes. And uh, <coughs> we had quite a quite a challenge trying to find a suitable stone for repairing that. That's right, it? yes. So when, when, we, when we originally managed to get the scaffold up there and had a look at the stone itself, um, although the, the repairs that had been done in the past were, were very well done, um, sadly they were with cement um, and, and the erosion that that had caused to the stone was quite catastrophic in some areas. Now, we we're quite lucky that it wasn't to the whole of the cornice, but in, uh, you know, mm. in certain sections. Um, and certainly where the water egress was coming through and trapping behind the cement, um, yeah, it required some thought as to how we were going to do it. When we looked at the, when we took the cement repairs out and we looked at it, we realised um, that it's actually a stone that's very local to us where we're from near Stamford. Um, and it's a Ketton limestone, which seems very bizarre um, to be so far away from Ketton up here in Rotherham. Um, but... With a bit of research, the, the Marquis of Rockingham, who was a, a land own, uh, an owner here at one point, um, owned land down there. So it's feasible that they would have had access to the stone and it would have made it cost yes. effective to get the stone. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating to find out why these little intricacies are there and why limestone sections on a sandstone building. It's not necessarily the way it should be done, um, but that's the way it was done. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, we actually found that uh, we couldn't get Ketton stone of the right block size, ended up using Ancaster limestone, which That's correct. is similar stone. Yes. I mean, it's, it's marginally different, yes. but, we're able, but we could salvage some of the Ketton. Uh, That's correct. So what we found is in some of the units that had, had decayed in some areas, once we cut the rot away, we actually had some large sections we could pull out. Now we could carefully cut around them and stitch drill um, quite reasonable sized chunks of the ketten out. And what we did is actually take that back to our yard. And then that was reworked down for egg and dart indents. So we've actually managed to replace about five or six different units along the cornice using the original stone. 
Um, and then the rest, sadly, had to be done with, with Ancaster. Um, as much as it looks beautiful, it would have been nice to have it in the Yeah, it does look fantastic. And I mean, on a day like this, when the sun was shining onto the stone, I mean, it really, it really brought it out. We're now, we're now actually sort of, uh, we've got to the stage where we're actually putting the urns back on the building. That's Are right. there any particular challenges with that? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think um, logistically, so to move in the sort of side of the urns up, we're, we're going to have a crane. They're going to be lifted in stillages, um, mm. the ones that we use to take them down. Um, and essentially the stillage sort of keeps the urn cradled securely, um, yet delicately within a cradle that we can lift up. Um, once we get it up, we've got to then strip the cradle out to be able to lift the urn into position because we can't do that with the cradle on. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of uh, logistical um, problems that we're going to come across. We, we've got plans in place to help us get that up there and then the timing of taking the stillages off the crane and getting them onto the building um, are going to be um, tight. But we have a plan in place. We think it's going to work. And... If it doesn't, we will adapt the plan and come to that as we, as we go and we'll find a way that works. But it will be, uh, it'll be a challenge, um, as everything is when you move in large units of stone. How, how do you reckon they would have done it originally? Such huge weights and primitive machinery. Yeah, relatively the same way. So it probably would have been some form of crane, probably um, pulled or operated by animals. Um, and it, it quite possibly would have been like a turnscrew crane where the animals walk around. It slowly right. tightens the right. rope to pull the unit up. Um, so essentially the same way, just we're using machinery. <laughs> and, and how did you cope? I mean, obviously, in the middle of all of this, we had the COVID-19 lockdown and uh, the site was closed for five weeks. I That's think. correct, yes. And, you know, sort of, how did you keep yourself busy during that uh, uh, It was a challenge. Time? Yeah, it was a challenge, but obviously with a job, of this size, um, there's a lot that goes on in the background, you know, so the, the sort of paperwork chains that have to follow, um, changing health and safety procedures ready for coming back to site, um, all needed amending and working out, and uh, a lot of liaison with Robert Woodheads themselves um, as to how we were going to manage it when we come back. There's a lot of conversations with suppliers as to whether we'd be able to get the material. Um, we luckily had a bit of notice and we managed to secure some stone secure the mortars and the sands that we need um, before we went into lockdown. So we were very lucky that even though most of the site work had finished, we could continue working stone away from Rotherham um, and get it worked ready for when we came back so we could hit the ground running. Yeah. Um, and it yeah. worked. You know, we were very lucky. There's some people that are nowhere near as lucky. Um, but yeah, just planning with the contractor yes. um, and the, the other contractors on site, and it worked. Yeah, I must, I must say that it was, um, it's, it was so good that um, the disturbance of lockdown made such little impact on the project. Yes. I mean, it's, um, you'd hardly know that we had been closed that's down right. for that period now. Yeah, and that, that's testament to the, the, the management of Robert Wood. Yeah. They were brilliant. Yes, yeah. yes, Absolutely. What would you say was the sort of the most challenging aspect of all the work you've been doing here? Uh, so I would yeah. probably say the scale. <laughs> right. Because right. They're, they're, we, predominantly it's three rooms, but these are not three standard house rooms. These are three. Yes. Individually, there would be three mansion rooms. Um, and we've had to do them all at once. Now, it's helped us in some ways. For example, when other trades are working on one roof, we can move to another area. But logistically, that's not always very productive. So it's been, it's yeah. been difficult just managing the logistics of a, a, um, a site of this size, um, and especially getting some of the size of the units of stone up to the levels we need them at and into yes. the right location. Yeah. Um, it's taken some very sort of close liaison with um, SGB, the scaffold company, um, and, and Andy Stanford. Yeah, and of course you've had a temporary roof over it yes. all that time, which is an advantage in that it keeps the rain off. That's exactly right. But it makes access more difficult for exactly, some things, yeah. doesn't it? So in some areas, for, especially for the cornice, we may have decided we wanted to use cranes, which was completely out of the option because of the, the temporary roof over the top. Yeah. So it took a lot of thinking on how we could logistically move the stone. Obviously we've got the health and safety implications of using, uh, moving big units of stone. We can't manually lift them. 
um, and we don't want to see people trying. So we have to think about ways we can mechanically get it up there. And it's difficult, but yeah, it's been it's been achieved. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, well, I mean, it really um, it's really been worthwhile. So so you know, I think that um, we're we're coming to an end of this this section, and I think that now we're going to have a um, look at the roof at close quarters with um, Sean and his apprentice. So um, we'll see some of the finished work that they've produced. Brilliant. Hello, I'm Ben Halifax. I'm a level three apprentice mason at York College. I'm 20 years of age and I am a stonemason for Heritage Masonry Contracts. So Ben, how do you feel your technical ability has developed since you've been on Wentworth Woodhouse, taking into consideration all the, the different scopes of masonry we've had to deal with? Well, in terms of masonry and what we've done before, um, it, it's been a lot of smaller projects. Um, the scopes of work has been highly different in terms of scale, but also the different finer details of what we do in terms of the baluster repairs, all the balustrade fixings. Uh, there's a lot more complex and sort of more thoughtful processes that need to be put in place to make sure these things go right. Okay, and how do you feel that the the amount of work we've had here and the variety of work has aided you in achieving and, and going for your level three bank of masonry? Well, in terms of actually working stone, um, a lot of the units on here are obviously far more detailed than anything we've worked before in terms of the actual plinth caps, um, cornice work. It's, it takes a lot more thought process and a lot more planning, which is what level three is all about. It's all about the setting out, which is the key part about the whole thing, and then processes and how you actually work the stone. Yeah, so Giles, we, we, we have managed to get an apprentice through his apprenticeship while we've been on this job here. Um, and he's managed to do his, complete his level two apprenticeship in bank masonry and progressing now through his level three. And we're hoping he'll probably complete by the time we finish the works here. Um, it'd be good to see some of the work that he's been producing. Uh, maybe we can cut and have a look at some of that now. So here we have a piece of Woodkirk sandstone. This is the stone that's been primarily used across the whole job. In the process of working it, um, I used a variety of different tools, so angle grinders, uh, mason's mallets, tungsten tip chisels, um, a variety of different setting out methods, so um, right angles, levels, set of squares, the whole lot. Um, roughly, to work this unit, it took me about probably about a week to start off with. It was a very slow start. Um, I was sort of getting my bearings again after not being at college for a couple of months. Um, I started off by grinding most of the bulk out. That is mainly what I'll normally start off with is taking most of the bulk out. Then the rest I'd like to either work by hand or with an air compressed pneumatic chisel. So Giles, the uh, decision not to clean um, areas of the original stonework was taken. Um, what was the thinking behind it? It really came down to economics. Um, it, it, you know, we just need to concentrate on the most urgent work, and that was stopping the water coming in and stopping lumps of stone falling off the building and onto people. And um, so that actually cleaning is quite a long way down the list, it may never happen. Yeah. Um, it depends how long it takes us to actually get to that point that we feel sure that the future of the building is sufficiently secure that we can spend money on things which are purely for aesthetic reasons. Um, and also with the thought that if we clean the stonework, we've got to spend more money on repairs, as we can't just clean it. We've yes, got to actually right. repair what we clean. Yeah. Yeah, we, we often get asked if, if the building is going to be cleaned. Um, and we do kind of lead people to believe that the dirt is there. It tells part of the story. And if we clean it, we're essentially sterilising the building. Yeah, we, we, are, we are going to be doing a little bit of work to sort of, for example, clean the bird droppings off the carvings on the pediment at the front. Yes. So it hasn't got white streaks. And as you know, we spent some time... Um, brushing down the urns yeah. to remove the excess dirt from those. So the appearance of the building will be lightened when, when the project is complete, but it won't be, it won't be pristine.
now free of scaffolding for the first time in over two years, the full glory of Wentworth Woodhouse can be admired once again. Thank you.